The Lord has kept us busy through Ethnos New Zealand and by far the most exciting part of our ministry is mobilising the next generation to missions. Over the last year we have had the privilege of processing the Peden family from Rotorua to get them to Papua New Guinea and they are still happily service, serving in building maintenance and also house builds for missionaries out in the jungle. We've discipled Liam from Riverbend Church in Havelock North, getting him to the point where he is now in our Bible College in Wisconsin in USA. We have currently right now processing and orientated Josh from Fenton Park in Rotorua as he prepares to get over to Papua New Guinea to help with the many building projects that we have there. And we have Anna from Tauranga in early stages of our online Bible college. This is all happening while COVID is knocking us all out from normal life. This is a proof that God still has missions as his priority in his economy. If Bible College Online is something that interests any of you here, come and talk to us after and we can tell you more about that. Please pray for us and these people and others that we haven't met yet as we work with them. There is huge challenges today for our kind of work. Also, grab a copy of our international magazine. There's some on the table there. Have a, um, we also have our videos, God at Work. There's a link to that. Take the card. That is a 30-minute updated look at what we do around the world, how we do it, why we do it. And for those who might like to see what it's all about, we have Interface up and running again next year, Lord willing. So take a card for that. Um, also, sign up for our weekly updates if you're not on that. We have a very short update every week that we put out of what God's doing around the world. We need your prayers. And if you do, we'll give you a free copy of our um, chronological teaching material, Who is God? It's a summary of God's salvation plan from Genesis to Revelation through Christ as the promised Redeemer, Deliverer. And our church planters, this is the way that they approach planting churches for decades now. And we've seen many churches established through this way where there, where there were no churches. It's also a really good tool for evangelism right here as well. And it's in an easy English format. So sign up to pray and take one of those. Now, as you know, for part of our ministry is to bring the awareness of missions. But what you may not know is the challenge that that is to get into new churches to bring that. So to gain invites, this times I've been crazy enough to suggest that I could fit into a theme that you're doing and recently I had one church reply, yes, that will work. We're going through the book of Joshua, chapter by chapter. And then I read on, but the week you are here is chapter 21. You can speak into that. Chapter 21, what's that all about? No way. It's all about the 48 towns that were given to the Levites. All listed out one by one. What on earth was I thinking to suggest that I could fit somebody else's series? How on earth does that fit into Ethnos New Zealand's vision statement, a thriving church for every people? Or what about the relevance for today and what about your vision statement, worship, discipleship, outreach? So come with me and let's find out in what I've titled Scattered to Bless. And we'll uncover this in a chapter that's really easily overlooked because of its many lists and like happens so often in scripture, we are blessed if we dig down deep. And I sure was. Enough to bring this modified from the original to share with you today. So let's set the context. Chapter 21 concludes the settlement process of Canaan 
The land has largely been conquered and now divided out among the 12 tribes as you see here on this map. The tabernacle has been set up in Shiloh and you'll notice there is an absence of territory assigned to Levi. Now this follows God's divine order as Moses recorded in Deuteronomy 18.1. The priests who are Levites, indeed the whole tribe of Levi, are to have no allotment or inheritance with Israel. And so this is where chapter 21 opens. And reading from verse 1. Now the family heads of the Levites approached Eleazar the priest, Joshua son of Nun, and the heads of the other tribal families of Israel at Shiloh in Canaan, and said to them, The Lord commanded through Moses that you give us towns to live in with pasture lands for our livestock. So this is no angry demand. They're just stating what God had promised them back in Numbers 35 verses 1 to 8. Back to verse 3. So the Lord had, as, so as the Lord had commanded, the Israelites gave their Levites the following towns and pasture lands out of their own inheritance. And then from verse 4 all the way down to verse 42, we find listed all of the towns, the surrounding pasture lands that were given to the various clans, as well as how they were appointed. And here you go, here's a representation of all the 48 towns that were given to the Levites. And you notice the six little donut rings there? They are the cities of refuge that were allocated to as, as Levite towns. And they are part of that 48, and they are well worth a study on its own. Like many Hebrew lists, we may need to read this and reread it a few times to get our Western minds around what has been communicated through them. So this morning, just streamlining this down verses 4 to 8, we find all the tribes listed and how many towns they gave to the Levites as divided out through Levi's three sons, Gershon, Kohath and Merari. A careful look at these at verse 4 will reveal that the Kohathite clans was divided into two groups. The priests descended from Aaron and then the rest of the non-priest Kohathites. And then Gersh, the Gershonites and the Merarite clans, that is how the Levites became divided into four groups, each with their towns allocated to them. And then if we go down through verses 9 to 42, we get all the detail, name by name, of all these towns. Look at all those names. And that's the sort of list you give your youth group to read as a race with a mouthful of dry weepix. <laughs> you could try that today. This list is important, though, because what it does, it forms a legal record of all the allocated towns for the Levites. But if we step back from all of this, we'll see that it's also a new beginning for the whole nation. For the first time in their history, they now have a place to call their own. Within around 50 years before this time, remember they were slaves under a tyrant pharaoh in Egypt, and now none of them except Joshua and Caleb are older than around 70. The huge majority of them were born in the desert and here they are fulfilling God's promise to their ancestor Abraham made almost 700 years earlier, a land of their own. This is also a new beginning for all the Levites. For them, during all the years of desert wandering, they had their place in the camp, grouped tightly together, surrounding the tabernacle. The tabernacle was in the centre of the Israelite camps and the Kohathite Aaronic priests, they were camped at the eastern front end of the tabernacle. The rest of the non-priest Kohathites, they were all together on the immediate south. The Gershonite clans were alongside the western wall and the Merarites were on the north. 
This had the Levites all tightly clustered around the tabernacle, and this is all very practical for them to perform their duties of service and for their responsibilities for moving it and the furnishings as they travelled. But now that they were in the land, the tabernacle was permanently standing in Shiloh. This greatly reduced their workload, and since they would no longer be needed to pull up stakes and move it like before in the desert wanderings. So now this raises a question for us. Why would God change the order that he had previously established and scatter them among the 12 tribes? And so this morning we're going to look at three reasons. The first is prophetic. This is a fulfilment of a prophecy made by Jacob some 450 years earlier. If we look at Genesis chapter 49, when Jacob gathered his sons around his deathbed for his farewell blessing, it's more of a curse that he pronounces for Simeon and Levi. If we look back further into Genesis 34, there is the account of their massacre of the men of Shechem. And it's to this that God is calling them to account through Jacob when he says, their swords are weapons of violence, they have killed men in their anger, and hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Cursed be their anger, so fierce, and their fury so cruel. And because of that, here it is, I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. So this is what we could call the forgotten reason or a consequence of why the Levites were scattered. And as a side, you'll notice on the map here, there is no allocation of land to Simeon. As we're told in Joshua 19 verses 1 and verse 9, Simeon's inheritance lay within the territory of Judah. Now this is a good reminder for us today that nothing goes unnoticed by God. All kinds of injustices abound, weapons of violence and wars and senseless invasions that we're watching right now. Biological gender that's become hamstrung to please a wicked and adulterous generation and the fierce and cruel killing of thousands of unborn. We can be sure that none of that and more goes unnoticed by God. Justice will be served because all man is accountable. 1 Peter 4.5 could not be clearer. They will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. This is not just the overt wickedness of the ungodly, but as believers, we too must guard against the covert that works in our earthly nature. Colossians 3 Paul does not mince his words as to what that looks like. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, and lying. Verse 6 of that chapter. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things. See, if we don't, as saved people, at the beamer judgment seat of reward, we will be brought to account on those things and we will suffer loss. Getting back to the Levites, realising the lack of their own territory, it would be really easy for them to grumble and complain about no allocation of their own and that they were scattered. Why them? They weren't the ones that aroused God's wrath years earlier. And we too can easily look at the lot we have in life and when we compare ourselves to others, think God is unfair or that we are living somebody else's consequences. But like one commentator has well said, if we can get a hold of what's going on here, it liberates us and will prove to be a blessing to us and to those around us. Instead of questioning God's purposes, we can delight in serving him where we are at. If we dig a little here, 
we will find the incredible grace of God at work as the main reason for their dispersion. In only a way that God can, he brings good out of the bad. He didn't flip-flop on what was prophesied through Jacob, but he turns that very situation around to bless all of Israel. And that becomes the basis for the second reason for scattering the Levites. It was substitution. They had become the adopted substitution for the firstborn of the entire nation of Israel. God speaking through Moses in Numbers chapter 3, verses 12 and 13 says, I have taken the Levites from among the Israelites in place of the first male offspring of every Israelite woman. The Levites are mine, for all the firstborn are mine. When I struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, I set apart for myself every firstborn in Israel, whether man or animal, they are to be mine. As a representation of all the firstborn, God had given the Levites positions of service set apart for his purpose and his glory. And so now, and here's the blessing, by being scattered, they would be accessible to positively influence those that they lived amongst. Moses, in his final prophetic blessing of the tribes, said of Levi, he teaches your precepts to Jacob and your law to Israel. That was Deuteronomy 33.10. This was their new responsibility, to instruct Israel in the law of God and to maintain a knowledge of his word among the people. Someone has estimated that no one in Israel lived more than about 16 kilometres from one of these Levite towns. And therefore, like my Bible knowledge commentary points out, every Israelite had nearby a man well versed in the law of Moses who could give advice and counsel on the many problems of religious, family and political life. See, the potential for good among the tribes was almost unlimited. Now this is similar for us. That is a great picture of the church's responsibility for outreach and missions as we live scattered amongst the world. As Christians, we like the Levites are well versed in more than the law of Moses and our potential for good among those around us is almost unlimited. We have the gospel of grace. But this does mean that missions and evangelism has to be scattered outside of the church, not like the Old Testament model all clustered around the tabernacle. If we stay clustered around the church, it will be harder for us to reach the lost. And if we stay clustered around the church, we won't know that there are those who are asking to hear about God. In Papua New Guinea, our ethnos missionaries planted a church among the Iski people, and since 2017, they've had a continual stream of delegates from a neighbouring people group, the Kaminiman. They don't speak the Iski language, but month by month, through interpreters, they've been requesting missionaries to come to their village, learn their language, and teach them God's story. The people are asking this because of the difference that they have seen since the gospel took root in the lives of the Iski people. As the Iski church has matured over the years, this year our missionaries could then survey this need with a view to seeing missionaries. They said, as we hiked through each village, we were greeted by countless people with fruits tobacco and betel nut, those are the traditional tribal gifts, these people would express to us through an interpreter that they are scared and they do not know where their spirit will end up when they die. Who will tell us God's story? Indeed, who will? Someone will have to be scattered to bless to reach these people and that's what it's taken God using scattered to be to bless people all around the world. Just 
our organisation alone has people scattered through 33 countries like you see here. And this is why Peter talks about us becoming like aliens and strangers in the world. And in 1 Peter 2.9 he says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. This is why Ethnos New Zealand looks for those from this royal priesthood who are willing to become aliens and strangers in the world to serve in missions. When we lived and served in the Philippines, we were forever reminded of this when we had to renew our visas at the alien control office. Seriously, that's what they called it. Our kids had great imaginations of little green guys sitting behind the desks with three eyes and antenna. But it was us that were the aliens in a foreign country. It's this alienation to missions that saw us leave a successful, thriving business here in New Zealand to become career missions. However that was, that God wanted to use us. Starting in the jungle, there's our home in the Philippines. And today, based here in the jungle of New Zealand, <coughs> it's going more tribal, isn't it? As we lead and administrate and mobilise people through Ethnos New Zealand, it's this alienation to missions that sees the likes of Stephanie from Christchurch that we rec recruited some years ago to leave her successful, lucrative career and use her skills and education as she helps our kids homeschool in some of the most isolated places on the planet. She does a fantastic job and she is keeping many families out there establishing churches where there are otherwise none. Recently she's been pulled in to teach in the Indigenous school that our mission has established for some of the tribal people, teaching those who will potentially lead the church into the future amongst an increasing secularisation. And what Stephanie's heart in all this, and using her words, that I might be a teacher that points students to Christ. By the way, our organisation worldwide has a serious shortage of teachers in multiple countries, teacher aides as well, and maybe there's someone here that the Lord might be nudging towards this. Or what about tradespeople, doctors, IT people, administrators, Bible teachers, translators, pretty much anything that anybody is willing to ask, how can I help? Any part that any of us have in missions, locally here in outreach, or discipling this generation to walk in step with Jesus will mean that we will have to live strong and courageous like Joshua and his people. It will be against a tide of personal pursuits and it will be against, amongst those who have a less and less knowledge of God. It isn't easy and we can't do it in our own strength, nor on our own, especially in missions it takes a huge team. And that leads us to another reason why the Levites were scattered. It was all about provision. See, these guys were about the Lord's business, not their own. They could not support themselves in farming or cultivating like their brothers from the other tribes, and they could not support themselves in any industry. Theirs was a ministry among their people and it was their people that were to support them. Deuteronomy 18, 1 to 8 lays this out, how God expected the Israelites to provide for not just the priests but for the whole tribe of Levi. They shall live on the offerings made to the Lord by fire for that is their inheritance. And then the, those verses go on to list out the parts of the animal sacrifices that were to be given to them, as well as the first fruits of the grain, the new wine, wine and oil, and the first wool shorn from the sheep. And then the reason is given in verse 5, 
for the Lord your God has chosen them and their descendants out of all your tribes to stand and minister in the Lord's name always. And verse 8, they are to share equally in Israel's benefits. This is what we see in the Christian church today where many have a paid pastor or two supported by their people. And it's also especially seen in missions, although there's a twist to it here, in missions it's never the unreached that will support their missionary. The missionary is like the Levite, scattered among those they are reaching, but sent by the local church. It's the church that sends missionaries. But then, because of the costs, and because most New Zealand churches are too small to fully support them, that's why they need additional support from other churches and individuals. Like you guys here, we want to thank you how you are a partnership with us. In more, most places um, our missionaries work, they cannot engage in employment to keep themselves there. First off, many times it would be illegal. Secondly, their work is full-time plus some. Another reason is God has made a way for more than just those who go to be a part of what he's doing through their prayers and finances given as their sacrifice for the Lord's work. Back to chapter 21. We can't leave it with just the Levites and their towns. In the last three verses, there's really a conclusion of where the whole book is heading to. They could, they conclude Israel's conquest of the land and could even be seen as a climax to the whole book. So let's read verses 43 to the end. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their forefathers, and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their forefathers. Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord handed all their enemies over to them. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to the house of Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. You know, what strikes me here is how the Lord gave and he gave and he gave. Did they deserve it? No. And in view of God's holiness, we don't deserve anything either. But God gave what he promised because his word is sure. He had sworn by oath again and again to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and then to Moses and to Joshua, and it happened just as he promised. The language of these verses is dripping like honey. Sworn possession, settled, rest, enemies handed over, good promises, everyone was fulfilled. And God did exactly what he said he would do in Joshua 1.3. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. And why wouldn't he? As David says, Psalm 119, 89 and 90. Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You see, we're looking at God's character here. It's all about his faithfulness. And that's why all these generations later, we can trust him even amidst all that's going on around us and in whatever it is he's called us to do. We have Jesus' promise from Matthew 6, 31 to 33. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. We've personally seen the Lord supply everything that we've needed for the last 27 years. With our ministry, it's impossible for us to earn an income, and month by month, we never know what's coming in, but it's always been enough. There's been many times with some incredible needs right in our face. Early on in our time in the Philippines, there was this teenage guy, Jayath. He was the son of Judy's friend, 
and he'd been knocked off his motorbike, and because his parents didn't have the funds, he was sent home to live as a cripple for the rest of his life. His state was appalling, and it shocked us that his was a fixable condition that just needed funds for the hospital and orthopaedic surgeon. So because of Judy's fellowship, we seriously felt convicted to get him to the hospital, even though we didn't have the funds, but trusting that the Lord would provide. By the time that hospital bill came due, we received the exact amount from a friend in Australia who had no knowledge of this. You've got to remember that exact amount, what was given, converts to US, then to the peso, right down to the last amount. Right when we needed to make that payment, God provided the money. And that's just one of many, many stories I could share about God's faithfulness. If any of us are scattered to God's purposes, wherever that is, we can trust our faithful God to provide all that we need. So as we conclude today, how do we see the faithfulness of God? Have we lived or are we living to prove God's faithfulness in our lives? Or are we hanging on to our lives so tight that there's little room for him to show it? It is a growing process to see God's faithfulness reach full bloom in our lives. The question is, if we are young, are we growing to understand more and more of God's faithfulness? And if we're getting on, can we say we own God's faithfulness through our life experiences? The encouragement for us today, regardless of whatever we are facing, God remains faithful. Just like he turned around ancient consequences, he turned them around to bring glory to himself by the Levite's accessibility, we too are recipients of God's grace and splattered, scattered to bless others, not splattered. Sometimes it might feel like it, but we are scattered to bless others. This is totally possible because of God's unfailing faithfulness. As we go home today, as we look at how we can bless others, we can do so by clinging to God's character and confidently living out Joshua 1.9. Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Shall we pray? I want to thank you, Lord, that we have your word in our language. We've had it for centuries, and sometimes we ignore it. Forgive us for those times that we do. Sometimes we cursory read it, and we miss so much of what you have for us. Thank you, Lord, for what you show us, even among chapters like we just looked at today. And we thank you, Lord, that there's so much in there that applies to us. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us ministry like the Levites, all of us. We are the scattered ones in a world that have very little idea of who you are. And so, Lord, we just pray that we walk strong and courageous as we look for our part in that and that we're willing to do that wherever it is you have for us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.